Hello, and welcome back to another special edition of our podcast. I am here joined by Gina Godby here. She is running for Maricopa County Prosecutor. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. So this came up because there's been a lot going on with the Gilbert Goons in terms of plea deals, and we, the public, have questions, and you have been gracious enough to volunteer to answer some of those questions. Thank you so much for being here. So a lot has happened since you and I last talked. We had the Gilbert police chief with other police agencies come out and designate the Gilbert Goons as a gang and also say that they would not be pursuing any gang-related charges because they couldn't prove that the crimes were in furtherance of the gang. Can you please first just explain that? Well, they would have to say in order for it to be a gang, um, and a lot of people believed it, it could be an informal association can be as long as there are felonies being committed in furtherance of the gang. So there must be some, um, like you could have a bunch of drug sales, a bunch of burglaries, um, assaults where they typically will yell out their gang names or something to show that they're trying to gain status in the gang. Uh, we've charged that threatening and intimidating before as a gang charge. So in um, in their mind, they must, when you looked at all of the felonies together, they uh, may not have had enough of these individuals, defendants to say each one was done specifically to support this gang. Um, and the Gilbert Goons, keep keep in mind, sometimes the traditional gangs, when they come now they're calling this a hybrid gang, the traditional gangs, they used to have their markings, they'd spray paint, they had, um, so they would do intimidation sometimes in their gang area, or they would attack a rival gang. So those were easier to prove. Um, if they weren't um, maybe giving threats as the Gilbert Goons as a group, uh, that could be why they felt there wasn't enough evidence of that. Sure. It just seems like it would have been better to say, you know, they're not a gang. They're just a bunch of kids out doing crimes. They're not a gang. And then, okay, I get it. But like, how do you call them a gang and have all the crimes that you've tied them to, you have tied them to them, and then say they're not in furtherance of the gang? How can those both be true? I think that that's what people are frustrated about, because um, we know behind the scenes that as these incidents were occurring, members of this group were threatening the victims. They were threatening witnesses to keep everything hidden and not silent. So they acted in a lot of ways through threats and intimidation that gangs would operate under. And, and that's where um, I think there's frustration with, um, with the community. Right. And then the next week, there was an appearance in the Preston Lord murder case. It was a pretrial conference. And during that conference, one of the things they did is the prosecutors filed a motion to for combined discovery ev evidence for seven related cases plus Preston Lord's murder. So these were all the Gilbert Goons teen violence cases, some of which then, you know, were offered plea deals. And we're going to talk about those plea deals. But the prosecutors in filing their motion to connect these and say that these evidence is interwoven and we need everybody to have access to all of the evidence because it might be related and have inculpatory or exculpatory evidence. That seems like they're tying them together. I think there's an argument they are tying them together. And so they're presenting that they're, maybe they're going to in the future file 404B evidence um, and try to say that that's some motive that led uh, to what occurred here. And if so, then that begs the question again, if they're all related, they're committing multiple offenses, potentially in the furtherance of this group or this association. So isn't that similar to what would be your typical gain charge? What is 404B evidence? Can you explain that? Yeah, 404B could be other act evidence um, that you typically cannot at a trial present other acts that they did um, because you're not supposed to consider anything but what they're on trial for. If you file a 404B, uh, 404B motion, you could say that this other evidence goes to intent, motive, lack of mistake. So you can get it in for other reasons and talk about other crimes. I see. Okay. So that's probably the goal then with sharing all of the information across the 
different crimes? It, they still would have to file the notice, but they could be just sending discovery out because usually the defense would want everything as well to make sure that there um, there's no exculpatory material. So it and it also just could be ease of the prosecution. Let's just file it all together, send it out so that everybody has everything. Okay. The other thing that happened was that there were plea deals reached yeah. between the defense and the prosecution in a number of these cases, including Christopher Fantastic, DeLeon Haynes, um, Jacob Pennington, and Garrett Bagshaw. So, and in all of the plea agreements, the prosecutors had agreed with the defense attorneys not to seek any incarceration. You know, I... I, I've been trying to get the actual copies of these plea agreements for a couple of days now, and they have not been released. And um, because in these plea agreements, the devil sometimes in the details, and we really need to see the details. And when I say that, I look at uh, fantastic, Christopher Fantastic. He pleads guilty to two sixes. It looks like they were possibly on different separate offenses. If mm -hmm. they were, it when you offer somebody six opens, probation, and your silence on jail, it, it begs the question of, um, he got a really good deal. Behavior like this, and you have two, we used to, and I spent 25 years there. I trained uh, hundreds of attorneys. I managed the Northwest Valley. You have two separate offenses, um, unless they were sixes. That's what I, I, I need to get more details. But one looked like an ag robbery, which is a class three. You're pleading that all the way down to a six on a victim offense. Um, I'm surprised that that's not a six designated. That means that these kids are not going to have any, when, when they finish their probation, they're all going to have misdemeanors on their record. Okay. And so that is interesting. What is, what is an open versus a designated? So an open would be, you plead it to a class six and it's treated. Um, and sometimes it could be treated as a misdemeanor till, um, unless they, um, violate or it can be treated as a felony. Um, it just depends kind of, of the agreement of the parties. But when you have a designated, that means you have a felony record. You can't buy a gun. You can't vote. You have certain restrictions and you're going to have to at some point ask the court at some time down the road to set aside your conviction. But it's on your record. People are going to know about it. And the most important thing is if you commit another offense, you have an illegible prior. Um, so it's there for five years, or if it's a class 10, it's there for, um, it could be up to 10 years, you know, or forever, depending on, on the nature of the charge. But the, but by making them six opens, that means eventually all these kids are going to have misdemeanors on their record, which, um, which will enable them to, like I said before, the most alarming thing is by gun. If you're engaged mm -hmm. in violent behavior, you're not going to have a criminal record or a felony conviction, and you will eventually be able to purchase weapons and and have all your civil rights. I see. So for Fantastic specifically, he was arrested on suspicion of aggravated assault and aggravated robbery in one incident, and then a different incident of aggravated assault and misdemeanor assault. So that's what that's what's interesting to me because I've been watching my opponent now and um and what they don't say when they there's this big comment of it's not our fault the judges are are ruling a certain way the judges are releasing them but what what's neglected is the prosecutor has all the power so when you have two, multiple offenses if they wanted to that they could force a mandate prison in this case they chose not to, and and that's and with a young age, I can understand that. But now you have, you're already not going to give prison. You're not going to mm -hmm. do a no agreement. You're going to do probation. But then on top of that, they dropped it all the way down to a six opens. Mm -hmm. So there's another gift or lowering. Then you don't mandate jail, which you can. And I know the prosecutor said, well, we're not saying they're not going to get jail. We're not mm -hmm. saying these weren't serious offenses. It's up to the judge. But that's neglecting to say that you as the prosecutor could have mandated it. If you believed and you wanted to send a message to the community, then you could have you could have mandated three months, six months, nine months, a year. You could have given them credit for what they served in custody, but you could have mandated jail. That my opponent, the county attorney, chose not to. She chose to punt it and defer it to the judge. 
it does seem odd when all eyes are on it. Mm -hmm. Seems like a bad move in an election year, but um, I think it's just fairly normal, right? That's what I'm. That's what I'm seeing now. I'm. I spent the last um, this last year um, as a victim's rights attorney. And so we we usually get victims that that the trial advocates the child uh, all these crisis family advocacy centers kind of send them to us. These are victims who are upset who want a voice, so they seek us out. And when we um, when we go to court, um, I'm starting to notice this new trend that the state is putting the burden on the victims. You know, we we walked out of court today, and and the side of the building said justice. But the justice is also for victims of crime. It's not just for the defendant. Mm -hmm. You know, it, when you have a crime, the victims deserve, you know, what, what does it say in the Magna Carta? To no one should we sell, deny, or delay justice. That's what our system is built on. And that includes the community. That includes victims. And defendants deserve justice. They don't deserve to have free passes and lenient sentences. And I think we've, we've forgotten the voice of crime victims. And that's what frustrates me. So when I see these things, I have a lot of questions when you say, well, the judge could, but then you put the burden on the victims to go to court to ask the judge. You could have stipulated, you could have mandated, you could have relieved the pressure and the decision was chosen not to. Mm -hmm. So in Fantastic's case, the, they are expecting supervised release and electronic monitoring. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, so so in that one, I want to go back for one more second because the victims objected to release and the, the state again deferred to the court. So even when the victim, both saying that this is a serious case, but we're going to defer to the court. My question is, it's interesting that the state wouldn't even say, you know what, we, we agree we, under the circumstances, we would object to release. No, they deferred to the court. Victims had to stand up by themselves and ask the court not to release. And then uh, the court decided to release. So supervised release, which means uh, pretrial services and then electronic monitoring. So they have a monitoring ankle bracelet. So they will be monitored in that community. Okay, so he then, he just has release pending trial. He still has charges pending? No, pending sentencing. Pending the sentencing. I see. Okay. Thank you for um, explaining that. All right. So he was in custody, but now he pled to a, a probation and he pled to a six open. So which could be, will, will eventually be a misdemeanor. So, so the defense says, look, judge, you're, you're, you're basically um, agreeing that he's going to be on probation. So give the guy the, give them an opportunity to show that they're not a danger to the community and that they'll do well. Um, and so he asked for it. And that's that's not uncommon in those situations. But it's just interesting to me. Um, it's interesting to me how on one hand you could say we're not being lenient. We're being tough. The court, the judge could impose a year. But what you're not saying is we chose not to tie the judge's hands. We chose not to force it. We chose just to stay silent and let the judge determine determine it and let the victims have to advocate for it. That was what, let's be honest, of what happened. Okay. Garrett Bagshaw was offered diversion. And I just want to, I want to understand, like, what's the difference between diversion versus probation and that sort of thing. So can you walk us through what, what is diversion? Yes, and um, I don't have it here, but if you go, diversion is is something that um, has been one of the most shocking things that I've been in, encountering over the last uh, year because it is expanded under um, under Rachel Mitchell's watch, and I could tell you what diversion is is it looks to rehabilitate the defend uh, defendant. And it used to be offered in minor offenses, a drug offense, a shoplifting, domestic violence where the victim agrees. But under the current uh, county attorney, uh, uh, these diversion programs have expanded, um, just uh, expanded uh, beyond belief in my thing, uh, my opinion. And I want to tell you if I can spend a few moments to talk about diversion because it's shocking and I wish I had my my form, but I think I left it in the car. Um, but it's on the county attorney's website. You can took on July 2023, their diversion uh, strategy thing. Um, only 52% of defendants were successful on diversion. Mm. So think about that. 52%. That means 
48% were unsuccessful. Then you flip to the next page. And I'm gonna talk about which crimes are eligible in a moment, but you flip to the next page and it said of those only 52%, that doesn't sound like a high number for diversion, but of those 52%, it was like 4.4 had a new felony referral within a year. You know, 12 months recidivism for successful completion of diversion. Well, what does it mean to successfully complete diversion? So you do 10 or 20 classes, your case gets dismissed, you're successfully completed your diversion. Okay. Ten, and the 10 classes or 20 classes is determined on if you are, if you are determined by some assessment to be a low to moderate risk or a high risk. So if you're a high risk to reoffend, they'll still give you diversion, but instead of 10 classes, you have to do 20. Then your case is dismissed. So then you look back in the next sheet and it said of those people who succeed, 52%, um, they had 15.5 uh, had new arrests in the, within that time period. And four over 4% 4 had new felony submittals. That is a terrible rate. And then you look back into what's eligible for diversion. And if you look at their chart, robbery, law assaults on law enforcement, uh, law, uh, unlawful flight, weapons offenses. I saw an arson, impersonating a police officer, offenses that never should be offered diversion. I am shocked when I saw this list of these crimes. Somebody who commits a robbery should not ever get their case dismissed. They're getting their case dismissed. So when I say those same liberal policies that have been in some of those other seats, uh, um, cities that we see in the news, it is here. It's the reason why I say there's an epidemic of leniency in Maricopa County. We've become soft on crime. That never would have been allowed under the Rick Romley, the, uh, the Andrew Thomas, the Bill Montgomery era. We never saw these type of cases go through diversion. And I can tell you what's even more shocking, Billy, is that even if when I say the victims' voices have been lost, victims are objecting to diversion and they're going to diversion anyway. I spent, I was after spending 25 years at the county attorney's office, I became the Goodyear city prosecutor. Um, and then I helped build out another municipality's prosecutor's office. I walked around and we toured and spoke with prosecuting uh, city municipal prosecutor's offices across Maricopa County. I don't know anybody that off that offers diversion over victim's objection in a mm -hmm. misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. This is at a felony level. And mm -hmm. that's what what's surprising to me that they would do that in a victim crisis, a violent brick, you know, assault uh, case, not just a property case and put them through diversion over a victim's objection, but basically that's it. So he won't even have to go on probation. He could do 10 classes probably in a six months and he's gonna walk away with nothing. Hey there, co-parents, it's Billy Tarasio with Modern Law. And let me tell you about our family wizard, our preferred co-parenting app. It's a game changer, I use it myself. With features like documented calls, secured messaging, shared calendars, and more, our family wizard makes co-parenting smoother than ever. Trust me, I've seen the difference that it can make. Join the over 1 million parents and family law professionals who trust our family wizard to make co-parenting easier. Ready to take some stress out of co-parenting? Head to ourfamilywizard.com forward slash modern law. Okay, now Jacob Pennington's an interesting one because... He was one of the first arrests. He was the person who said, yeah, the Gilbert goons are a thing. It started with a Snapchat group. I'm a Gilbert goon. And he he was charged now with three different crimes. He's set to go be sentenced. And the plea deal reached between his attorney and prosecutors is for him to get supervised probation and 100 hours of community service. Yep, that's that was the choice. That's where I said of of um, not any jail, not deferred jail. I mean, maybe the judge and, and the county attorney said maybe the, the judge still could pose up to a year of jail. But as as the elected, if if I was the county attorney or when it what you know, um, I you have to take into account the fact that these this group terrorized a community. The the fear that they put in. You want to send a message that we're not going to tolerate this type of behavior that led to um, the tragic death of a young man. We're not going to to tolerate this and not. And I think I spoke to you originally. We know that there's other collateral 
I don't even call it collateral damage because it's collateral heartbreak. We know of at least what I'm hearing, two suicides that are connected to these this group. So they caused a lot of damage and heartache to this community. And everyone's going to walk away eventually at this point with misdemeanors or nothing in the case of a diversion. I want to ask a couple things about Pennington. So one of his arrests was in Pinal County. The other two were in Maricopa County. Do the counties coordinate or is, is this sentencing that we're looking at only for Maricopa County? This They should coordinate. And this sentencing is Maricopa. They'll each do their own sentencing. They'll each, you know, the one of the jurisdictions will probably um, transfer probation to the other so that there's only one probation officer. But they each should be um, handling it their, themselves. And there might be a designated in one of the counties. Um, I just don't, I haven't seen the plea. So, so I don't know. I hope. I hope that at least one of them is a designated offense so that um, that an individual who is committing multiple offenses is not going to be eligible to be, um, will be a prohibited possessor. So he can't possess a firearm uh, because he's shown a history of violence. Sure. What is supervised probation? What does that really mean? It means you're, you have a probation officer who will be, you'll be checking into. So uh, supervised probation means um, a couple things. One, you, you'll have like, uh, you're not allowed to contact your victim. You'll have certain terms that you have and you'll have somebody at least checking in on you um, and making sure that you're complying with your probation. If you don't, they can file a petition to revoke. It'll go to a court and then the judge can decide whether to, to revoke your probation and sentence you to prison or impose jail. So that at least they're being monitored. Um, as opposed, and I'll give you one of the concerns, um, and I think we spoke about that last time, uh, because right now the county attorney's office has been des uh, downgrading a number of felonies to misdemeanors and sending them to your cities and your your municipalities. The um, and that I think I gave the example. If I don't, for any new listeners, the Goodyear case where you have 19 bicyclists who were driving on a Saturday morning. You have a defendant who drove over all of 19, killing two. He didn't break for over 5.5 seconds. He claimed he had steering problems, but none of the analysis of the vehicle confirmed that. He had marijuana in his system. He said it was from the night before. And, um, but the county chose not even to file a negligent homicide case, sent those matters to the city for misdemeanor prosecution. The concern is most cities do not offer supervised probation. They have what's called unsupervised. So the court can say, obey the law, don't contact the victim, but nobody's monitoring them. And that's okay. in both, most misdemeanors. What does it mean to be monitored though? It means at least you've got to check in, whether it's monthly, weekly. Um, if somebody's not paying restitution, you have a victim and they know it's somebody that they can contact. Um, and if they're not, like if they, they don't update them on their change of address or something like it, it love there's different levels of supervision, uh, intensive probation and, and regular probation. So um, it, there is a huge um, concern in our justice system that the ones even being supervised aren't adequately being supervised. And it's very difficult to get people's probation revoked. Um, there's a revolving criminal door, and I, I'll divert for one more second to give you an example of that. Um, do you remember the officer that was stabbed in the neck a couple weeks ago? That was in the news. He was he was a person was trespassed at a QT, and he was he was escorting him out, and he stabbed the officer in the neck. Yes. Um, in that case, that defendant had um, he was sentenced to prison on just for a couple months. Basically, was a mitigated term. He'd already had. Uh, credit. So he served only a few months. He's released from prison with a probation tail. So he's supposed to be monitored on probation. In the course, he commits another drug offense. He's got multiple drug offenses. So instead of uh, revoking that probation, instead of sending him to prison on the new charge, reinstated and sent to probation on the new charge. He commits another offense instead of revoking his probation, because now he's on probation for two Instead of revoking him Obviously or sending him to prison, him. he just reinstates him. Okay. Then he had another revocation. So you have a person who gets out of prison who's got over, uh, I think it was three years of documented history with mental health and using meth addiction. 
and we never force treatment. I think he got in a couple months in jail. That's not enough for somebody who's been as a mental health with an addiction for years. Uh, there was not mandated inpatient. There wasn't locking him up until he could complete an uh, a treatment in the jail, just releasing him. <clears throat> well, he's been released. The officer escorts him out and he stabs the officer in the neck. And thank God the officer didn't die. So when you say that, this is somebody who's on supervised probation who continued to commit new offenses and was just reinstated over and over. This is the revolving door of in our criminal justice system that got me to jump in this race because it has to change. If we don't fix this, these stories are going to continue and it's going to be one tragedy after another. So when you say supervised, it's kind of you hope that they're supervising them, but we need to call them out and say, we got to do a better job because this revolving door is unacceptable. And you can't blame all the probation officers on that. Because I think when I did a post, they they said, well, to be fair, uh, sometimes it's not our it's not our thing, the judge. And, and it's also the state. The state has to agree to dismiss. They dismiss those petitions and they, they allow it to be reinstated instead of forcing prison. And that's the county attorney. Um, so so uh, supervised probation, hopefully they'll be monitored, but you've got to then, um, but there's a lot of questions and a lot of issues that we need to fix uh, to make sure that somebody doesn't continue to re-offend re and commit more crimes after more crimes and violate their probation. And we just have this history currently under this administration of reinstating. Do they have to do drug and alcohol testing or have curfews? Like what, what type of rules exist? That could be up to the court. Usually not necessarily curfew. It is obey the laws. Uh, but if they're young and there is a curfew laws, it would be. Uh, they would, it should, um, they can man mandate. Uh, they can, they're they not supposed to use drugs. They can they can mandate and make it part of probation or not to have a weapon. You know, there's certain ones the court can impose if they believe they're appropriate. Okay. I want to turn to Preston Lord's murder. Yeah. Um, to me, I was surprised by first degree murder for all seven. To me, it was surprising. To to me, based on like I don't know, it's all it's all subjective, right? But based on what I had learned in law school and kind of depraved heart murder, it seemed like second degree murder to me. Although I understand that felony murder allows you to see first degree murder. Um, and now I'm really wondering, A, I'd like you to know, I'd like to get your opinion on that. Um, yeah, let's just start there. You know, I was shocked about that as well um, because they're using the theory of first, first degree because of the robbery um, or yeah. no, the kidnapping, the yeah. kidnapping because they all surrounded right. them. And right. I've had other cases where they were kidnapping and I was told there wasn't enough time, even though when people were being kept in a room to allow that to be a, um, a first degree as a victim's attorney, again, in, in homicide cases. So I'm curious at how they're saying because they were surrounded that that is going to be enough um, of restraint for kidnapping. Um, and I think there that there is a, a significant question, even in the state's mind, that's why they did in the alternative. Sure. They have the in alternative there. Right. Um, so I, I, I would hope that that wasn't done because it's an election year to try to make it, um, to make it look like we're being tough. And then we have the alternative there to protect it. Because remember in the alternative, it can get all the way, go all the way down to a manslaughter. And well, I wouldn't be surprised. I want to ask about. Yeah. yeah. So we've got, you know, we've got this charges that come out that are real strong, real aggressive. And then I can't help but contrast that too, but we're going to let all these other people off of probation. And people are wondering like, what's really going to happen? What's a, what's what's actually going to happen in terms of plea deals? So that that's what's interesting because you have in the alternative, a second degree in there, and you always get the lesser included at second degree. So you're all the, going all the way down to manslaughter. Manslaughter, it could be seven to 21 at, um, and it's 85%. It's not even, you know, flat time. So I think in this case, I'm concerned because I would not be surprised if the family um, 
is let down and disappointed in the end because I think they're expecting something really big and good to come out of it. And it's all the way. And now you tell them, well, at trial, um, nobody's going to take a 20 year plea or 25 year plea when at trial they could get 10 and a half. Oh, really? Because if it's manslaughter, it goes all the way down to 10 and a half. If it's uh, a second degree, it could be 16 presumptive. He's young. You have multiple people. You have people hitting. And how do you prove you always are going to, they're all going to be pointing the finger at each other of who really caused it. And their role was more minor. Um, it's not going to be, it's not going to be that, that easy to prove. And I'm seeing significant homicide cases um, and what's coming out with their pleas that I would, um, not that I agree with it at all, but, but I just, what I'm seeing, I think the family is going to be extremely disappointed when the pleas come out. I would expect because it's an election year, they're not going to make a plea for, they're not going to make a plea, especially not before my primary in, uh, July 30th, because, um, they're not going to make a plea for a long time. Okay. Right now. They've got a trial tentatively scheduled for July of 2025. Does that mean that they're going to be tried together? The, the, this case will not go to trial for at least a year, mm -hmm. um, maybe even longer. They are at this point together, but the defense uh, amount of time the defense is going to move to sever and they're all going to start pointing their fingers at each other. And mm -hmm. so if you have antagonistic defenses, then they get a severance as a matter of right. Mm -hmm. So it will be multiple trials. Um, the state will try to keep them together. But if if I'm going to say I didn't do it, he did it, then they have mm -hmm. to be severed. Got it. OK, so we're definitely going to end up with several trials for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and and pr probably different plea deals based on role, right? Yes. And that would be the question of um, who was the most culpable? Are they going to flip some of these? And that's where I said where I wanted to see the plea, because a lot of people are asking, were there testimonial agreements? We don't know. I don't want know. to ask about that, too. So how common is it for, is it possible that, probably not likely, but is it possible that the prosecutor said, you know, I'll give you supervised probation and 100 hours of community service if you testify against all these people and you say blah 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 is that allowed no the, the way you described it it's not allowed but there's something similar so so like let's just take christopher fantastic he had multiple offenses he had that class three that that was a high level pled down to a six open he seems to have gotten um, a pretty good deal. So the question is, did he get that deal because there's going to be some type of, of testimonial? We need to look at the plea agreement to see, because on the plea agreement, it'll say, uh, pursue, you know, agrees to the term as attachment A or B, and there usually will be something else there. We have to find out if that, that exists or not. Um, but the state can absolutely flip one defendant uh, to testify against the other defendant. They can never tell them what to say. So usually what we would do is we would do um, we would do a, a meet a interview with them before and we would let them tell us what they know. Um, and there's always agreement that um, they have to testify truthfully and um, and we'll never tell them what what to say sure. because you can't. You can't can you record what they say that way yes. if they change their story, you can impeach them? Yes. And not only do you record it, but those are all disclosed to the defense. Got it. Of you know, that you're going to be testifying against. Are but as still... as sometimes you have to, um, because it's the only way to know all the evidence. So, so if you have like the ghetto, if you have a robbery and somebody goes in and they um and I I had a case like that, so I could tell you I had somebody who was a girlfriend. Um, of one of the defendants and they were going to go and commit um, a robbery. In the course of the robbery, he beat him and shot him. The girlfriend didn't know he was going to do any of that. So she was still uh, guilty because she helped buy some of maybe the ties or certain things to allow him to do it. And they knew it was a robbery. So you could say what well, was foreseeable in a robbery, the victim may push back and then they killed him. So you're guilty of felony murder. Mm -hmm. uh, but her role, she wasn't even at the scene. So in that kind of case, we I did flip her and do an agreement. She did testify against the other two. And what did she end up getting? What was the agreement? 
I gave her um, two consecutive one year jail terms. So she served two years and she pled guilty to the high crime. Okay. So is that is that a, a potential of what we might be looking at for somebody who didn't ever touch Preston Lord, but was there and videoed it? You know, that if somebody was just there and they videoed it, mm -hmm. you have to then show somehow that aided that offense. And that well, maybe he chased them. Maybe he was, okay. I don't yeah. know. I'm not so, saying that that's real. But. So video, because we don't have a lot like the good Samaritan rule where if you see right. something, you have to intervene. There's nothing saying that you can't record it, uh, but you would have had to take part in it. Because mere presence is a defense and mere presence is if you just happen to be there when a crime occurs and you have your phone on it, that's not, that's not, doesn't make you guilty of actually um, assisting in the crime. Well, the, you the have to assist in it. The allegation against him is that he recorded it and he drove away some of the defendants and participated in conversations about perhaps destroying evidence, something to so, that effect. So, and so that's the first degree murder. Yeah. So that is um, the fact that maybe he was filming it while it was ongoing and then he, he left together. They're trying to say he they would have to make the nexus that he was an accomplice. And usually what you argue or what I've argued is you don't bring you don't bring um, a witness to a crime scene. If right. you're going there to target, you're going there with people who are assisting you to target. He's just the documented person who's watching it for so they could share it later because they're committing these crimes for the um, adrenaline of committing the crime, to share, to boast, to enhance. And then that goes back to your other question, to enhance the status of potentially their group or their gang. If so, isn't that a gang charge? It, it's, it is all connected and, and um, something that, that um, should be looked at by the state. Okay. Um, what is your realistic prediction on what happens for sentencing? On these ones that already pled? No, the on Preston Lords on the seven. That is so hard to tell. And I don't think it would be appropriate for me to say because if we I just am, edit this out, we just yes. edit it out and pretend that didn't happen. That's okay. Because if I am successful, which I hope to be, I might be the county attorney. So it's not appropriate me for me to be even weighing in on on those cases. And it would depend on the evidence and um and you would hope that the charges are appropriate and you would hope that they are, um, like I said, that uh, there was a grand jury indictment. Um, how weak or how strong those charges are is gonna depend on that plea. Uh, but I already have concerns that they're not as strong as we would like them to be because they had the in the alternative language there to protect them. Totally. Um Okay, let's see. I don't think I have any other questions. Do you have anything else you want us to cover? No, I think I think that 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 is the key. And, and when you talk about supervised probation um, and um, and the revolving door, those I, I just would really like everybody to to go to my website, Gina for Justice, to learn more about some of these cases that we talk about. Uh, because we have a real issue in the in the criminal justice system of leniency. And the fact uh, of what you're seeing play out here is someone who's going to talk tough. But when you have a choice to mandate and to tie the judge's hands, um, that hasn't been done yet. And that's and that's um, disappointing because you can't just say, well, they still could get it. Uh, you're supposed to be the leader and you're supposed to be advocating. And if you're going to send a message that this type of, um, of rise in teen behavior is something that we're going to take seriously of, then you impose tough sentences to send a message. That's called deterrence, either general or specific deterrence. And I think, um, unfortunately, um, that has been forgotten at this time by the county attorney's office. It is all about their young they should get a chance. We're going to let them prove themselves, you know, and and forgetting about what the community and the victims want. Gina, thank you so much for being here. Primary is this July, correct? Yes, July 30th. Early ball ballots come out soon. Any Republican or independent who can request a Republican ballot, um, I'd be honored to, to receive your vote and, and try to return and have uh, balance the scales of justice is the main thing, to return and actually have accountability 
uh, to fix our broken criminal revolving door in our criminal justice system and um, also return, return the voice for crime victims because they've been silenced and it's unacceptable. We need we need to make sure the victims are supported. Um, criminal justice reform is 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 a good thing, but it never should come at an expense of a crime victim. Um, they've suffered enough and we need to remember that and return to to uh, restoring victims rights. Last question, because I'm an independent, can an independent voter request a primary for either party? Yes, you get to choose. You can't do both. You get to select which party that you would want to vote in the um, in the primary for. Got it. Good to know. We will get all of this information out. Gina, thank you so much. People know thank where you. to find you and good luck with all your campaigning. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Modern Divorce Podcast. Remember, anything you've heard today or anything you read online is not the replacement for actual consultation with an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Even if you called in and we spoke to you, you were anonymous and we don't have your details and you have not become a client of Modern Law. However, we would love to speak with you or you should seek out the advice of legal counsel or counseling or any other expert near you. And if you have an idea for a show topic or you need to speak with an attorney in Arizona, you can reach me at info, I-N-F-O, at mymodernlaw.com.